Oscillatory effort. We have an arterial oxygen desaturation of 3 or 4% or more. We have confirmation of cessation of airflow as indicated as no snoring on the screen. And we also have quite a bit of variability shown in the pulse rate channel. Now let's take a look again at the central apnea event. Here again is the central apnea event is indicated as CA. The mouse over indicates that the duration is 28.8 seconds, which is of course much longer than 10 seconds. We see confirmation of no respiratory effort and the event is of course followed by an arterial oxygen desaturation from 96% to 84% or in other words a 12% desaturation lasting 35 seconds. Both preceding and following the respiratory event we have sinusoidal effort and airflow and of course we have no snoring during the apnea event. Further confirming cessation of airflow and we have variability in the pulse rate signal. This is a classic textbook central apnea event. Let's take a look again at the mixed apnea event. Much like the obstructive and central apneas just discussed, we have a cessation of airflow lasting a duration of 42.37 seconds. We have no ventilatory effort in the first part of the event. However, we have resumption of ventilatory effort in the second half of the event. This confirms a mixed apnea. Arterial oxygen desaturation from 98 to 83%, which is a drop of 15%, lasting 38 seconds. We have no snoring during the apneic event, further confirming cessation of airflow, and we have variability in the pulse rate. Both preceding and following the sleep disordered breathing event, we have quasi sinusoidal or sinusoidal waveforms indicating both airflow and respiratory effort. All of this defines a mixed apnea event. Now having discussed the three types of apnea in detail, let's take a look at a common type of sleep disordered breathing event called an apopnea. An apopnea is defined as a significant drop in the amplitude of airflow accompanied by an arterial oxygen desaturation of 3% or 4%. The default rule used by the Braybon Metabyte Junior software is a drop of 30% or more in the amplitude of the airflow for at least 10 seconds or longer, accompanied by a drop of 4% or more in arterial oxygen saturation. Let's take a closer look now at the details of defining an hypopnea event. Here we see an apopnea within this highlighted area. We know this is an apopnea because it's a drop of 30% or more in the amplitude of the airflow for at least 10 seconds or longer and it's accompanied by an arterial oxygen desaturation of 4% or more. Also, you'll notice that there's continued snoring during most of this event. This indicates that it's a partial obstruction of airflow, not a total obstruct. There still remains heart rate variability. So to summarize, what we have is a decrease in airflow amplitude of 30% or more, lasting 10 seconds or longer, and an arterial oxygen desaturation of 4% or more. Now that we've discussed both apneas and hypopneas, let's take a look at how you might actually want to score an event. First, I'll remove this event by right-clicking and selecting Remove Event. Next, I'll left-click, drag to the right, and then Release. I'll select hypopnea. This is how one would score an event. However, the Metabyte Junior software is very reliable in its scoring. Having discussed both apneas and apopneas in detail, let's take a look at another phenomenon called positional apnea. Here is a case study which was recorded using the Metabyte Junior. In this instance, to really appreciate positional apnea, you have to take a look at the summary graph provided in the report. Here, what we see is the patient fell asleep supine at the beginning of the night around 20 after 10 p.m. When they're on their left side, the SpO2 is relatively flat. However, as soon as they go back to sleeping supine or sleeping on their back, you'll notice the SpO2 goes up and down like a yo-yo. When they turn to their right side, the SpO2 is relatively flat again. And as soon as they go back supine, the SpO2 is up and down again, the frequent desaturation. If you take a look at the respiratory results by body position printed out in the Metabyte Junior report, there's some really important information here. The apnea plus hypopnea index, or AHI, is 45.4 while the patient is supine. However, total non-supine is only 1.5. We know that any AHI less than 5 is considered within normal limit. Therefore, this patient, while sleeping non-supine, is within normal limits. However, sleeping supine, this patient has severe apnea. That's because their AHI is greater than 30. This defines textbook positional apnea. And the treatment for this may be as simple as avoiding sleeping on one's back. Below, we have a follow-up study performed three weeks later. The patient was given a positional treatment device, and the AHI while supine dropped from a baseline of 45.5 to 0, 0.0. Total non-supine went from 1.5 to 4.0. Therefore, this patient was cured 
because their AHI remain below 5.0. Such baseline of follow-up recordings are commonly used because this is one of the advantages of home sleep testing. Having discussed positional apnea, let's take a look at baseline and follow-up using oral appliance treatment within a dental practice. Here we have the same patient recorded twice over a weekend. The first night with no oral appliance as the baseline. The second night with the oral appliance as the follow-up. On the reports, we see that the apnea apnea index has a baseline of 16.4. With the oral appliance, however, the apnea apnea index went to 4.8. This means that we are less than 5.0 and may consider this a successful case because we are now within normal limits. If we take a look at the SpO2 data, you'll see that 1% of the night was beneath 90%. However, with the oral appliance in place, that number dropped to 0% of the time. This means that the patient's blood oxygenation level improved with the oral appliance, another measure of success. If we look at the number of desaturations of 4% or more, which are considered clinically significant, the baseline had 124 such events. However, the follow-up with the oral appliance only had 33 events, another measure of success. If we take a look at the breakdown of the respiratory events on the table, you'll see the breakdown of a drop of central events from 4 to 1, obstructive apneas from 8 to 0, mixed apneas did not change. However, the number of hypopneas dropped from 115 at baseline to 30 with the oral appliance. If we take a look at the events by body position breakdown, what you'll notice is a significant improvement in the apnea apnea index while supine. On the baseline night, the patient spent 26.5% of the night supine or on their back. On the second night, with the oral appliance in place, they actually spent more time on their back at 31.8%. However, what you see is a significant drop in the AHI from a baseline of 25.7 while supine to 6.8 while supine. This means that the oral appliance was quite effective because it's quite common for people while they sleep on their back to have the base of the tongue fall against the posterior of the pharyngeal wall. In other words, gravity pulling the base of the tongue down and collapsing that airspace. Oral appliances are commonly used to treat such a phenomenon and are often quite successful. On the all night breakdown of the SpO2, you'll see much more frequent arterial oxygen desaturations at baseline than on follow-up. So overall, this is an excellent example of how you can use the Metabite Junior to gauge the effectiveness of oral appliance therapy by using both a baseline and a follow-up. It is typically recommended that a dental practice always perform a baseline and at least one follow-up. Sometimes more than one follow-up is needed. This concludes our discussion of the clinical waveforms recorded by the Metabite Junior. If you have any further questions, you may call Braybon at 1-888-462-4841. Thank you.